thank thank you very much um, for having us at this forum. Um, I've come together with a very strong team in Nigeria to discuss uh, what we have been doing uh, to decongest uh, the correctional service in the wake of COVID-19. Like you know, I am Professor Don John Omale. I, I worked with the, Niger with the Nigerian Correctional Service for some years before I disengaged voluntarily and joined the university academic system. And before I joined the university academic system, I was a British Chivalry scholar to the United Kingdom where I studied master's in criminology at the University of Leicester. And then my PhD in restorative justice and victimology at the Montfort University, Leicester. And then returned back to Nigeria in 2009. So I voluntarily disengaged from the Nigerian Correctional Service as assistant controller of corrections. Uh, uh, so I have on the team with me, uh, Dr. Ujua Gomo and uh, Kevin, who have been doing great work on prisons reform in Nigeria. I will, I will pass it on to Dr. Ujua Gomo for her introduction. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Mali. Uh, my name is Ujua Gomo. Um, I am a lawyer. I also had an, um, an, my MPhil criminology in the University of Cambridge. I'm also <laughs> a Chivening Scholar and mm -hmm. a Cambridge uh, Fellow for Cambridge Commonwealth Society. Mm -hmm. uh, in addition to that, I have trainings both in psychology and sociology, and my PhD is on prison studies. Um, I am also the founder of Prisoners Rehabilitation and Welfare Action which is a non-governmental organization that was established in 1994 in Nigeria. Uh, with, but we do a lot of work, not just in Nigeria, but in several African countries, including interfacing with the African Commission on Human and People's Rights. I'm the former special rapporteur on police prisons and centers of detention for the Nigerian National Human Rights Commission, as well as an executive council member of the African Security Sector Network and the former president for the International Corrections and Prisons Association Africa chapter. I'm very happy to be amongst the panelists today, and I do look forward to a very interesting discussion, but also to mention that prior to uh, some of the recent works we've been doing, I have been also research fellow of the Institute for Development Studies of the University of Nigeria in Ubu campus. Good afternoon. Can you hear me? Yes, yes we can, can hear you. Yeah. Okay. Uh, good afternoon. I am Kevin Ugoke. Uh, I'm a correctional officer serving uh, in Just Custodial Center. Uh, I'm a psychologist. Uh, I I bought a uh, a bachelor's in psychology from the University of Nigeria, Suka. Then I went further to get a master's in criminology from the University of Uyo in Akwa Ibom State, Nigeria. Uh, presently, I'm a research student of the University of Jos. Uh, I'm uh, studying uh, criminology. Uh, it's wonderful to be here. Uh, I've done some studies uh, and research in uh, prison studies, cr crime and delinquency, as well as uh, um, uh, penology. So it's uh, my pleasure to be here. Uh, I want to I want to state that uh, uh, just yesterday I was promoted to the rank of uh, superintendent of corrections. 
uh, I'm happy to be here with my boss, uh, Professor Don John O'Malley, and uh, the most respected scholar, uh, Dr. Ujua Gomo. Thank you so much. I, I, Don, I hope that my introduction was uh, held. I'm not sure whether I was muted. Did you hear my earlier introduction? Yes, very well. So um, thank you very much for <clears throat> that brilliant introduction by the panelists from Nigeria. I, I want to kickstart this conversation that um, the Nigerian Correctional Service, we have about 240 correctional centers in Nigeria. And, and um, as at uh, 26th of January, 2021, the total inmate population in Nigeria was uh, 68,000. 283. Out of these 68,283, they are waiting trial persons as at 26th January 2021, where 47,498. So in view of this, it is very clear that the Nigerian Correctional Service has a problem at hand on how to deal with awaiting trial persons that are detained in the correctional service. Following this, um, the coming of COVID-19 in 2020 compounded this problem. And because of that, there was a presidential directive in July 2020, that prisons or correctional centers or custodial centers in Nigeria should be decongested as quickly as possible to avoid complication of COVID within prisons. And the presidential directive was complied with um, by the Attorney General of the Federation and Minister of Justice in collaboration with the Presidential Committee on Prison Decongestion and the prerogative of mercy. So on July, on 7th July, 2020, about 7,813 inmates were released on the basis of this presidential directive. This also posed a challenge to the Nigerian Correctional Service because some people some Nigerians were not happy that prisoners were just released from prison without going through um, any due process of law and so on. And that um, showcased the argument that we have been putting across in Nigeria that there is a need to mainstream restorative justice practices in the Nigerian Correctional Service. And I want to say categorically, that in 2020 or 20, in 2019, the Nigerian Correctional Service Act approved by the president officially mainstreamed the use of restorative justice and other non-custodial practices in the Nigerian Correctional Service. So I have with me uh, Dr. Uju Agumo, who has been a technical lead in the implement, implementation of the Nigerian Correctional Service Act and uh, to tell how with the implementation of the Nigerian Correctional Service Act in decongesting our custodial centers. Thank you very much. Pass this on to Dr. Uju Agomo. Uh, um, thank you very much, uh, Professor Mali. I think you raised quite a lot of different um, uh, uh, points. Uh, so I'm going to take those points um, in a, a little bit of um, uh, um, 
uh, structure that will enable us to digest this, this, uh, this issue deeper. So first, it's to mention that when you talk about the congesting custodial sentence, uh, centers, or what we used to know as prisons in Nigeria, that there are two major factors that we need to keep looking at. The first factor is the rate of reception of persons into custodial facilities, the rate of reception, the rate in which people get into those facilities. The second is the duration, the duration they spend while in custody. Now, once we can deal with these processes, it enables us to deal with these issues in a very good way. So now when we talk about the type of persons who we find in custody in Nigeria, we already have known that a disproportionate number of these persons are persons who have not been yet convicted. So that's a key point that we need to make. And we're talking about population of more than 69% of those persons who are in custody, who basically have not been convicted, which of course makes this issue a little bit much more difficult. Now, the second level is the fact that we also looking at overcrowding. And this notion of overcrowding is basically calculated by looking at the designated capacities of each of the custodial facilities and the number of persons as at that particular time in their respective lockups. And we did an analysis recently in terms of those persons who were in all the facilities as at 1st of March 2020. Twenty-one, but around this. So the first level of that discussion is what I would um, bring to our mind in terms of what it's the key structural shift that happened with that new piece of legislation. Several critical things. One of it was to then expand the hitherto scope of the then Nigerian prisons service to incorporate the community correction perspective. So the very first section says that now that there shall be a Nigerian correctional service that should be made up of the custodial service, which is the Nigerian, former Nigerian prison service that we know, and the non-custodial. So apart from the name, new name, it then had this expansion, which created the community correction component, which is something so beautiful for us as a nation in Nigeria. Now, the second thing is that it went ahead to provide the processes that will enable us actualize that component. So from section two of that Nigeria Correctional Service Act, specifically subsection 1A to D, it gives us an idea of what is the real objective of this new law. And it, it goes this way. It says that the objective of the new law is one, to bring Nigeria a power with international human rights standards and best correctional practices globally. The second objective is to provide an enabling platform for the effective implementation of non-custodial measures. And then they went to the third point, which is about reformation, rehabilitation and reintegration. And then the last bit, which has to do with providing an institutionalized mechanism to deal with the problem of persons who are waiting trial, in other words, also the issue of overcrowding. So at this moment, let me just take two slices. So first, if I take the second component, which is about providing the enabling platform, before 2019, before the 31st of July 2019, when the president assented to this new law, we had laws such as the Administration of Criminal Justice Act of 2015 and the Administration of Criminal Justice laws that are applicable in many states of the Federation. And many of these had provisions that relate to non-custodial measures. Okay, for example, the Administration of Criminal Justice Act of 2015 has a clear demarcation in terms of both Part 44 and Part 45 that talks about non-custodial measures, but not much was being done. So when it used the phrase, providing enabling platform for the effective implementation of non-custodial measures, there is intent. And let me flag it and then I perhaps I pause uh, to allow other panelists to speak. Now, one of the key things that that law did was when it talks about enabling platform. So in the new law from section 
eight of it, it began to now introduce within the structure of the Nigerian Correctional Service a, an angle that will be able to accommodate the non-custodial component. So it starts by expanding the directorate to say, from now on, there shall be not less than, there shall be a, a minimum of eight directorates, which is now a shift from former six, eight directorates, one of which shall be designated for the non-custodial. Then it goes to talk about having the deputy controller general in charge of non-custodial. He goes also to talk about having the different offices that relates to these very non-custodial measures. So in terms of having the staff, at least there are, as I speak now, staff that have been deployed, even while they're waiting for enabling budgetary allocation, but that, you know, that they are still hoping that will come. But there are staff being designated and across the country, you have the, the directorate of non-custodial measures, both at the federal structure in terms of Nigeria Correctional Service, but in all the states of the federation. Then you also have the section that deals with the issue about the funding. It talks about the non-custodial funds. That is another thing. So it provides a platform that e people can also uh, provide support and funding that can help accommodate new, this new institution. In a, the third angle, it also Oh, it looks like we've frozen. Um, Dr. Amali, if um, if you want to step in and and maybe we can start to unpick some of the thoughts from... Okay. Um, thank you very much. Hello, Dr. Oju is okay, like... No, 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 sorry, that it not caught me, Grant. I'm going to just round up now so that please that it can open it up for me. So now beyond the issue of the structure that we have both at the federal, state, and zonal administrative levels of Nigeria Correctional Service and the funds, the non-custodial funds and the staffing, then also it then gives a lot of power in terms of what can be done, done in terms of the different parts, as well as establishment of the National Committee on non-custodial measures and the state committees, okay, which at the moment have not been activated. So you, you can see, as uh, Dr. Malay mentioned, the issue of the mainstreaming. So that has now been integrated, but a little bit more can be also be done, but maybe I will pause now because I believe that um, some other point but they can come up and I can also explain how some other sections, be it section 12, have also tried to deal with the issue of overcrowding. I can also explain the mechanisms in terms of providing releases so that we can see how we going forward, we can sustain these mechanisms. Let me pause now so that um, the other panelists can have their own bites. Thank you. Okay, um, thank you, Dr. Oju, for the policy brief on the implementation of the non-custodial uh, service act uh, Nigerian Correctional Service Act 2019. And Kevin. Wow. Thank you very much. Uh, you know, you are currently on ground at the Just Correctional Service Center. And I've, I've monitored your work on the implementation of the Non-Correctional Service, uh, Nigerian Correctional Service Act 2019. As you know clearly, section 43, subsection 1 to 3, clearly mandated correctional service officers to implement restorative justice principles and practices within the Nigerian correctional service. And there are other sections that also mandated correctional officers to um, use other non-custodial services like uh, probation, parole, and and community service. As a, as a practitioner, as a correctional officer who is currently a practitioner at JOS Correctional Service Center, what's, um, what evidence do you have so far from the implementation of the Nigerian Correctional Service Act 2019 regarding the application of non custodial services in our correctional centers? But uh, thank you, Prof, for this opportunity. 
Um, we've done a lot in a uh, JAWS, actually. Um, JAWS is one of the leading uh, commands that have uh, taken the bull by the horn uh, in the implementation of uh, non-custodial measures. Um, uh, the, the Nigeria Correctional Service Act came uh, at a time that uh, we're having this problem of uh, the pandemic, and it came in a very right time. Uh, during the pandemic, there were some of these um, uh, mobile courts that were set up by the government here in Plateau State and in various states of the Federation to uh, punish those who violated the, uh, the um, uh, protocols uh, that governments uh, put in place to uh, stop the spread of uh, the pandemic. Um, here on the plateau, we uh, the non-custodial service was handy actually in um, reducing the number of people who will have been in prison, who will have been sentenced to prison. Uh, during that period, we had more than 500 people sentenced to non-custodial, that's a community service. And uh, you will have imagined if such people, uh, such number had uh, been taken to prison, uh, we will have uh, had a very serious issue in containing them in our custodial facility. So uh, we've, we've done a lot uh, here in the command. Uh, we have employed uh, not, uh, the community service. We have a uh, supervised community service sentencing. We've, uh, we've supervised the uh, probation and uh, suspended sentences that are, are being uh, designated to us by the courts. Uh, one of our major measures we use in a uh, as uh, the non custodial is uh, the restorative justice. As you know, the restorative justice is an avenue that promotes healing and a cordial relationship between offenders and the victim, and even the community. Uh, what we do here is that we liaise with the court to provide the restorative uh, justice services, especially at the trial uh, stage. Uh, like uh, 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 Dr. Ujo have said, we have uh, our officers in almost every part of the country. Here on the plateau, in the 17 local governments of the state, uh, we have posted we have posted the uh, non-custodial officers to every local government to uh, to support in the implementation of the Nigerian Correctional Service Act and also sup uh, supervise uh, non-custodial sentences. Uh, we also liaise with relevant agencies here to provide the restorative justice services at the pre-trial stage. Uh, we liaise with the police, the civil defense, uh, NGOs such as FIDA, uh, even human rights organizations. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, can I continue, sir? Yeah, yeah, continue. Okay, uh, we also liaise, like I said, we also liaise with relevant um, agencies to provide restorative justice services at the pre at the pretrial stage. That's before it gets to the court. Uh, we've liaised with uh, organizations like uh, the police, the civil defense. NGOs such as FIDA, that's Federation of International Women Lawyers, with liaise with uh, human rights organizations, faith-based organizations to settle issues uh, between uh, interested parties. Uh, we've even liaised with some communities, some organized communities 
to settle issues uh, bordering on uh, land disputes and uh, other chieftaincy issues. Um, we've also liaised with organizations uh, with a very considerable workforce uh, who have uh, employer-employee issues uh, 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 between them. We've, uh, we've helped, uh, we've come in in this aspect to help uh, settle uh, issues between uh, employer and employees. Um, in the correctional facility where I work, where we try to restore healing and a relationship between uh, the offenders in our custody and their victims who are outside the correctional factors in their communities. Uh, you find out that most of our offenders, uh, when they are released, they find it difficult to reintegrate back to their society because of um, the fact that they might be victi uh, the of, uh, victims outside might uh, not feel well that they are outside. So we try to invite their victims to the correctional facility and uh, we carry out a uh, restorative justice so that uh, uh, they will be able to reintegrate back to their communities uh, properly. Uh, we also provide, uh, uh, we've also pro uh, liaised with uh, some uh, NGOs to provide public awareness about the non-custodial uh, measures uh, in Plateau State, especially uh, the use of community service and restorative justice. Uh, what we found out here is that uh, most people are not even aware of the non-custodial uh, measures. And uh, people that are aware are not, uh, don't know uh, how it works. So uh, here on the plateau, we try to orientate the public and uh, other stakeholders about uh, this uh, new a novel uh, measure of crime punishment. And uh, so far, we've uh, actually succeeded in some aspects, uh, though we still have a uh, teaching problems. Uh, we have teaching problems in the area of, um, um, like uh, uh, the doctor have said, uh, we, uh, uh, we lack uh, staff, uh, well, some of our staff also lack training. Then uh, funding is another issue. Then uh, there is this controversy between um, the various laws, like the Nigeria Correctional Service Act, the uh, ADJA 2015, that's the Administration of Criminal Justice Act 2015, and also the Administration of Criminal Justice Laws of the various states. There are these uh, discrepancies that uh, uh, are found in these laws, uh, and uh, I think they need uh, uh, to be addressed. Uh, thank you, thank we you very much, Kevin. I, okay, I got to stop, yeah, I got to stop you here, and thank you very much for the insight. Um, uh, Rob, Rob and the Costa, you have heard from uh, the people uh, on ground. And this evidence showcase the fact that restorative justice mainstreaming in Nigeria is still a challenge that we need further actions, further collaborations, further training seminars and uh, international collaborations. And I think this is an opportunity for the in CJ to um, uh, advance this partnership to be able to um, achieve what the law is actually meant for. Uh, Uju, Dr. Uju, are you there? Yes, I am, yes, I am. Uh, please, um, we have like 10 minutes now. Can you tell us what your, as a technical partner in the implementation of this act, what challenges uh, we have and, um, um, how do we make the judiciary, magistrate, judges, and other stakeholders participate and accept this law wholeheartedly? 
or any other uh, additional contribution that you can. Okay, uh, uh, I thank you very much. I, th I think, thank you very much. I think first is the whole notion of uh, popularizing the content of this law. So people need, awareness needs to be created. Um, the And in doing that, it is really important. Just like when you talk about the issue, remember that the Administration of Criminal Justice Act of 2015 was before the expansion of the then Nigerian prison service to now have Nigerian correctional service incorporating the non-custodial measures. So a lot of the issues, the judiciary need to understand that the powers of the judiciary should be in terms of determining the who gets to serve what kind of sanction and what is the nature of that sanction. So it therefore means you cannot use the judiciary to be supervising those on non-custodial measure. And this had to happen because the, you know, nothing can exist in a vacuum. It was because at the time these laws were made, there was no non-custodial service. So this creation of awareness is really important. Secondly, is the issue of building capacities. And building capacities is it's both in terms of those who would supervise. So for example, the six training institutions we've started doing training of trainers in all the six training institutions of Nigeria Correctional Service, but more still need to be done. But also, you need to also mainstream this into the training institutions of the various agencies, both in terms of the adjudication agencies like the National Judicial Institution and also the law enforcement agencies. So awareness creation, then secondly, capacity building. Thirdly, there is a need to have strong advocacy to engage and show that the government will put an adequate funding on this so that the necessary logistics that these non-custodial officers require should be provided for them. Fourthly, the various platforms that ensures us connecting with these processes, both from the local government area to that. And we're still most discussing this. Like at the moment, we're doing a training for legislators in the various local government areas, representative from each of the 17 leg um, legislative houses in Abia State. And we're trying to explain to them the need to interface with the correctional service so that in each of the uh, uh, local government areas, but also as they make their laws, that these laws should then comply with utilizing non-custodial measures. Now, I also want to speak, as I end up on this, in terms of restorative justice. If you look at the provisions in terms of the, and the scope, as envisaged in the Nigeria Correctional Service Act of 2019, for restorative justice, you see that it is very holistic. So we must begin to advocate that application of restorative justice must be seen that this has to happen for every offense that is a victim. So it has to happen at all stages. We have to fully mainstream restorative justice. In, so beyond it being an alternative, it is also something that can add to the quality of uh, the justice that we administer. So I think as part of this is that, but even lawyers, in the training of lawyers, people need to understand the benefit and it's accepted. So you have the lawyers, you have people who can communicate and uh, co collaborate with them in the community. And then, so that level of partnership needs to be an ongoing basis. And we must celebrate the good work. For example, we've talked about what's happening in Plateau State. In the FCT, for example, during the COVID-19, 23,000, 23,000 were supervised through that COVID period on, in terms of community service and the rest of that. So I am thinking that we should also begin to celebrate uh, uh, and acknowledge the states that are fully compliant and that are fully with Nigerian Correctional Service towards ensuring that effective implementation of the provisions of this act are made. And as I join you to um, also ask for increased international partnership, increased um, processes that allows us to celebrate the voices, the victim, the voices of offenders that have been healed through this process and the acknowledgement from communities that have benefited from a balanced administration of justice and a justice that recognizes also the interests of this society community as well as the victim and the offender engaging in this. So it is a process that we have continued and I think we should deepen it more. We should deepen it more. Thank, thank you very much. Uh, see, that, the, the, the implementation of the non-custodial Nigerian Correctional Service Act 2019 with reference to the non-custodial sentencing is, is very interesting. From Kevin's point of view, about 5,000 um, cases 
were treated under the non-custodial measures during the COVID-19 in the plateau. And from Uju's case study, over 25,000 in the Abuja Judicial District. You see, that's a very whooping uh, uh, figure. If 25 plus 5,000 uh, 5, would have been 30,000 awaiting trial inmates added to the number of awaiting trial inmates in the Nigerian Correctional Service sent, uh, custodies today, that would have been an, 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 uh, an excessive congestion of the correctional centers. So from this alone, I can actually say that the Nigerian Correctional Service Act, especially the non-custodial measures, have really contributed to the congestion of prisons in Nigeria within this uh, era of pandemic. Um, I, I, I want to give uh, John Costa um, time to ask a question because he indicated that he want to ask a question. So John Costa, if you are listening to me, up to you. Professor Don, thank you very much for the opportunity to ask a question to, to the panel. Um, it's been really interesting facilitating this news desk today um, on behalf of the uh, International Network for Criminal Justice, this new network. And talking to various people across the world, what's become very clear is there's lots of people with some really good practice, some really good um, opportunities of showing innovative ways of dealing, particularly around restorative justice. And I would say here in the UK, we've still got a long way to go to explain to the public what restorative justice is, what it looks like, what it can actually do. And obviously, that part of that is reducing the overall prison population, so a non-custodial non sentence. Do you see, and maybe I can ask each of the panel members uh, this question, do you see COVID-19 uh, the pandemic and the presidential decree to reduce the, um, the numbers of people inside your correctional facilities as a real opportunity to embed restorative justice in a positive way, because it's actually then stopping people going back into custody after, after the pandemic. Thank you for the um, opportunity to ask a yeah. question. Uh, Costa, just to jump in on that, I just want to say that um, I think it, the opportunity of having that issue of diverting people uh, outside custodial sentences, which happened during the COVID, as well as releasing people is important. But one thing that must be critically looked at is that this has to be on an ongoing basis. It has to be institutionalized. And there are mechanisms for that institutionalization. For example, in Nigeria, there is a prerogative of mercy mechanism. That prerogative of mercy we have both at the presidential level and at the state level. And this is supposed to provide oversight and review of those who have been sentenced, sentenced offenders, utilizing certain criteria, okay? Secondly, it is the other pro uh, mechanism is the pro uh, mechanism of the jail delivery. The jail delivery is usually charged, uh, chaired by the, was beheaded by the chief judge of the state and it focuses on awaiting trial. So for example, those who have stayed longer time than they would have stayed if they were convicted and and, and those and so many other reasons, including those whose bail conditions have been given, but it is too stringent and they are there. So then there is also the third level. So part of what we need to do is to ensure that this is sustained over a period of time, utilizing the prerogative of mercy, which is usually chaired by the state attorney general for the state one or the Federal Attorney General for the Attorney General of the Federation for the one on the federal, and the president and the state governors, respectively, are the ones assigned for that. And the one for jail delivery, which is the judge signs. But in addition to that, the section 12, subsection 4 to 12 of the Nigeria Correctional Service Act of 2019 puts a mechanism that allows the custod correctional officer to set up an early warning mechanism. So it says if your population in the custody has exceeded the capacity that is designated. You should con communicate within one week to the chief judge, the attorney general, prerogative of mercy, justice and committee and all that, and any other party. And you tell them, look, I'm having a problem. My population has gone much more than this. And they, those people have three months to do something about it. And if they don't do anything, and if you continue to admit them, you should be sanctioned. So all these things have to be activated. 
So the re review mechanism has to be activated and all that. But what we should do as a condition is to say, when people are being released, where are the real victims? We must make sure that as part of the package is that what the victims and the communities are part of that healing process. And the non-custodial officers should also you know, and continue to do this so that in the community that becomes relevant. So my answer is yes, but it's more than just having the presidential um, uh, directive. It is more of uh, utilizing already existing mechanisms for review on a continuous basis. Section 12, 4 to 12, prerogative of mercy mechanism and the jail delivery mechanism. Uh, th uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Oju. Uh, Costa, as a kind of a roundup, I want to um, answer or comment on your question that right here in Nigeria, we have been advocating for the acceptability of restorative justice in our correctional service or in the criminal justice system generally, because it is one thing to just go into the prisons and said, okay, we you have been here for some time. We are getting you released because we want to decongest prison without making the offender to take responsibility for their actions. So, which is why we are arguing that even if offenders, uh, prison, uh, offenders are to be released from prison because of prison congestion, go through the process of restorative justice where they can take responsibility for their actions. And that we give healing to the victims of crime. And the offender will also be remorseful even when he, he, he or she is to be released from prison. So that by the time he gets back to the community, the community will not see him as a, a, an offender returning back the same as he went into the prison because having the offender having gone through restorative justice process before his release from prison, we give a kind of satisfaction even to the victim and to the community where the offender is returning to. Secondly, secondly the practice of restorative justice is also, um, the, there is a, what I call the criminal econometric benefits of restorative justice even to government and to the correctionals uh, uh, the criminal justice system themselves because here we can take in an offender who mm -hmm. still bred into a uh, 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 custody awaiting trial for five months six months two years three years so of what benefit is that to the offender and even to the criminal justice system for somebody who stole a bread to spend five years awaiting trial eating government food wasting government resources. So we see and we continue to uh, advise government to implement and mainstream restorative justice in our correctional service center. So I'm very grateful for this opportunity that you have given to us, the Nigerian team, to share our view with the NCJ. And uh, I want to say that I, I want to thank Dr. Uju and uh, Kevin that, uh, uh, for their contribution. These people are also um, very active in the restorative justice advocacy in Nigeria, and they are a member of the African Forum for Restorative Justice, which uh, I am the uh, founder. So I'm happy for the opportunity. And will I say thank you very much uh, for giving us this opportunity to uh, sh share our view with the international audience. Professor Amali, thank you very much for pulling together such an esteemed panel to talk to us today. Um, it's been wonderful. We've got um, people watching on the live YouTube stream and also we've had uh, quite a few people, I think about 15, 16 people participating on Zoom as well. So we've had quite a good audience and hopefully they'll enjoy watching back. The recording will be available um, over the coming days uh, on the INCJ website, which is um, www.criminaljusticenetwork.com. Net. So please take a look at that. Some really interesting conversations we've had this morning and still a few more to come. So thank you very much uh, to all your panel, to uh, Kelvin and Dr. Agumu for your uh, responses and uh, wish you a happy rest of the day. Thank you. Take care. Bye. 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 Thank, bye. thank you very much. Thank you and bye.